All right, um, welcome to the chapter of chapter 10 where we're talking about bulk electrolysis and related methods to bulk electrolysis. As we were finishing last time, we were talking about using controlled current methods and also using those same ideas in control current methods but as in control potential methods for doing bulk electrolysis. Before we get into the notes that I've handed out, let me just mention a few things about bulk electrolysis for, for electrosynthesis. We'll have a little bit of time at the end of this uh, particular course to talk about electrosynthetic things that are happening in the world of industry. But let's just talk about, let's suppose we're doing a reaction in which we want to use electrosynthetic methods to cause some sort of chemical change. Um, as you know, you can use electricity as a reagent. You can oxidize or reduce some molecule to, do, to make some sort of desired reaction. And many chemical reactions that are done in, in industrial processes are oxidation reduction reactions. For example, combustion, a very popular method, is, a, is essentially an oxidation reaction, although you don't often think of it that way. Uh, we can use electricity directly, and in fact it is used directly in many cases. Often though, it's not the cheapest reagent. Uh, we can mine natural resources that, that have stored energy that are cheaper than electricity. For example, coal is a, is a reasonable reducing agent, and it's used as part of a chain of uh, chemical reactions to reduce, or to reduce iron oxide to form iron metal. So uh, we could use electricity directly to reduce the iron oxide in an electrochemical cell, but it's cheaper to use coal. One situation where it's not cheaper to use uh, a natural resources to do the reducing is the production of aluminum. There's no uh, sufficiently inexpensive reducing agent that has enough power to reduce uh, aluminum oxide or aluminum ores, aluminum containing minerals to the aluminum metal. So they use aluminum, in aluminum they use electricity and that's a significant fraction of, of what people are um, using electricity for in the United States is the production of aluminum. Uh, for electrosynthesis though, we might use electrosynthetic methods for smaller scale processes where we might want to use the cleanness of the reaction as, a, as an advantage. Let's just consider a simple problem. Suppose we had one mole of material that we wanted to reduce to some other process. So suppose we have a mole of ox plus it takes one electron to red. Well, if we do that one mole of material, we want to do that as rapidly as possible. We don't want to spend a year doing this electrosynthesis. We want to do it in a few minutes, perhaps, or, or less. Let's consider how feasible that such a process might be. Well, in order to reduce completely one mole of ox to one mole of red, we have to pass uh, one mole of electrons to do that process. Now, one mole of electrons is the charge on an electron um, times times a, a mole, and that's going to be about uh, um, let's see, that's going to be. Um, Let's suppose, I'm just going to run about 100,000 coulombs of electricity. Not exactly, but close enough. And uh, let's suppose we need 100,000 coulombs of electricity. Well, if we try to do this electrosynthetic reaction, let's say we want to do it really fast. Let's say let's suppose we want to do it in one second. Well, let's think about how reasonable that, that might be. If we take 100 coulombs of electricity and put it through one second, in, into one second of a reaction, that means that we're going to have to pass 100,000 amps. So if we divide that by one second, we have 100,000 amps of electricity. Now that's not something you're going to be finding lying around in the lab as a power supply. So we're not going to be able to do that sort of process. Perhaps industrially we could do it if we had a sufficient enough reason. Well, let's consider the other problem. 
if we had uh, to pass 100,000 amps of current through our cell, we have to worry about the resistance of our cell setup. And even at 100,000 amps, we have to worry about the resistance of the wires that are connecting the cells together and things like that, not just the cell resistance. Even if we had a very low resistance, say 0.001 ohms, which is really difficult to achieve in practice, we still are talking about uh, 1,000, um, I think so, 1,000, yeah, 100, 100, um, volts of IR drop. In other words, we'd have to apply 100 volts of electricity just to drive the reaction to avoid the IR drop. At the same time, we're going to be dissipating quite a lot of uh, resistance, and the amount of power dissipated in that circuit in one, uh, in one second would be 100,000 power is equal to I squared R, so 100,000 squared, 10 to the fifth, or 10 to the 10th, times 0 0.001, so 10 to the seven watts. In other words, we're gonna be needing 10 megawatts of power to, do, to drive that reaction. So that's obviously a situation in which we're not gonna be doing this sort of reaction. Now how can we minimize some of these problems? One way to do it is to make sure that the current density of our electrochemical cell is low. And the other problem is, I guess I didn't mention, is that we also have a limitation, not only electrical, but we have a kinetic limitation. Uh, if we try to re run this reaction so rapidly, it may be, not be possible because the reaction will not, in fact, allow the reaction to proceed at that rate of, uh, by electron transfer kinetics. So in, what will happen is if we try to force that much current through, the reaction will proceed by other pathways. And so we'll have side reactions. So a large fraction of the, of the uh, system may undergo side reactions. So what you want to do is run your reaction at a low current density to avoid kinetic limitations. Now typical current density even for a very rapid reaction would be something like one milliamp per square centimeter. So if we want to run our reaction at one milliamp per square centimeter, which is a reasonable amount, of course that means that we're gonna to need to have a electrode that has uh, 100 million square centimeter area. It's not necessarily that difficult. We could make a very large electrode, say with a carbon mat or something like that, and to do that reaction. So that's how we would get away with doing a very rapid reaction, by making a very large electrode and doing the reaction with a small amount of volume. Of course, remember also the problem is that we'd have to supply all that material to that electrode in one second. So we'd have to have some sort of a convective process or some way to force that material at a very high rate to the electrode surface. And so that's another particular problem. A much more reasonable process would be to extend that out. We might have to take 10 hours or so to do that reaction. Even then, we're gonna run into some problems with IR drop and so on. It is, if you tar start playing with the numbers. So you can see that doing the reaction with electrosynthesis is not, it requires a lot of additional considerations that you didn't have to worry about before. Size of the electrode, how much volume you've got, the kinetic limitations of the process, heating of the solution, IR drop, all these things we really didn't have to worry about in the analytical electrochemistry that come about when we talk about using bulk electrolysis. How can we help ourselves? One, one is we're gonna try to maximize area to volume ratios. We want to make the electrode area as large as practically possible while making the volume as small as practically possible because that will give us the, the greatest advantage in mass transport to the electrode surface and also will give us the greatest advantage in minimizing the effect of kinetic processes. Also with small volumes, that means that the distance between the working and reference auxiliary electrodes is gonna be small, help hopefully minimizing the, um, the effect of IR drop. Of course, 
The problem is we, our electrode may be of an expensive sort. It may be we need a platinum electrode, so it may not be possible to have a really large platinum electrode because it costs so much money. So there's always practical things that we have to worry about when we're doing with uh, bulk electrolysis. And of course, uh, this is just a, a brief qualitative idea. There's many, many books have been written on bulk, industrial bulk electrolysis processes and so on. Um, now just, to, just to mention, for example, in aluminum electrosynthesis, part of the interesting thing about it is that they're running their cells at not 100,000 amps, but uh, tens of kiloamps per uh, cell. And, but they're running at an over potential of three to four volts, which means that the resistance is quite small, their electrodes are very big, and so they have, uh, they have some effect. But the over potential of four volts is dropped as a resistive heating, which actually helps them out. They need to heat the cell anyway to get the reaction up to about 900 degrees C. And so some of the heat that goes into the cell is, is used for that process. And so they actually don't have to uh, heat it with some other material. Of course, uh, resistive heating is an expensive way to go about it. We all know that it's cheaper to use gas heat and uh, because we can use the energy stored in the gas uh, chemical energy stored in the gas cheaper than we can use the electrical energy uh, directly. But uh, that does minimize some of the losses we have with uh, uh, aluminum production. It's also one of the reasons that aluminum recycling is so, so much ad advantageous. We don't have to put in so much heat to do the aluminum recycling as we do to make the original aluminum in the first place. All right, well, the other things that we're talking about. So in this class, we're really not talking about bulk electrolysis on industrial scales. And we're just going to scratch the surface of bulk electrolysis for electrosynthetic methods. Perhaps we want to make some, something chemically. The other things we're going to be using for analysis, though, uh, with a bulk electrolysis process would be things that are electrogravimetric. And it uses, um, uses electricity to deposit some material on an electrode cell. And in fact, this is a very accurate way of doing it. We can measure current quite accurately and know it because of Faraday's relationships with Faraday's law that the electricity and amount of material deposit or amount of reaction occurring is very, uh, is, uh, is, is quantitative, that means that by weighing the amount of material that we deposit, we get a very accurate determination of the charge to material relationships. And that was one of the original ways that they determined this Faraday constant, uh, and still is, in fact, uh, 96,485 coulombs for equivalent. They deposited by using very carefully amounts of electricity, carefully uh, quantitative amounts of electricity, silver metal onto uh, an electrode, and drawing and weighing that very carefully, they deposited the relationship that we now call the Faraday. And uh, it's one of the most accurate, accurately known physical constants uh, by using these electrochemical methods. But people also did things before too with using electrogravimetry. They deposited metals and they weigh them. It's not a particularly accurate method for most things because most materials don't deposit a nice smooth film, so they get trapped uh, solution, it's porous, things flake off uh, when you're trying to dry it, so it's, it's not as accurate as you'd like. Another much more accurate way of doing this is called coulometric, where instead of doing uh, material to be deposited, you actually just do some reaction in solution to, to generate an oxidizing or reducing agent, or you can sometimes do things to generate, let's say, acids or bases in solution. And what you do is you essentially do a titrations by electricity. You coulometrically generate some titrant, so rather than by adding it with a burette, you can do it with an electrode. And because you can measure the charge very accurately and even very small amounts of charge, it's very easy to do very exact titrations using coulometric methods, and that's, an, that's a big advantage. Basically, you just find total charges, and so you need to have very accurate ways of determining current or generating currents and then determining the charge. The other major use of a, uh, bulk electrolysis is electroseparations, 
where we're trying to remove uh, components from solution. So you can use this. In fact, it's used quite a lot for what they call a um, uh, uh, I forget the name now. Uh, they use it to uh, strip out impurities in solution. For example, if you have a small amount of metal ions or something in solution, you can use a pre-electrolysis step where you, you electrolyze your solution for a long period of time to strip out the um, metal impurities. And it's often used under very, for very careful experiments to try to remove the impurities that way. Or you can send it through your solution flowing through a, a plug of porous electrode material and strip out the materials as sort of a pre-step. Pre, uh, pre In bulk electrolysis, as I said, the uh, advantage is to use small volumes, large area. And so one of the things that people often use are thin layer cells. You use a nice small volume in a, a very thin layer. Of course, when you have a small amount of material, you don't have very much uh, very many moles of material to analyze. So the reaction can occur quite quickly and within a few seconds often you can completely electrolyze that solution and get them on a charge and from that you can get, for example, the number of electrons if you need to know that or you can get, if you know the number of electrons, you can get the uh, concentration and, and so on. The other thing that we can do is a stripping analysis that people use for analysis is, uh, is that you pre-concentrate in a thin uh, layer of material. And usually that thin layer of material is a mercury cathode. You electrolyze a metal into the mercury. Because the mercury itself is a much smaller volume than the original volume that you've got, you've got a, an effectively a large pre-concentration step where you've concentrated your material from a large volume to a, a very small volume. Now when you do a, re after you do the pre-concentrate, you can electrolyze from the thin layer. And if you remember all those things we talked about with, uh, with uh, in electrochemistry, we're always just talking about the concentration, the current is proportional to the concentration for a thin layer or adsorbed species or for bulk species, it's proportional to the concentration. So by pre-concentrating, you effectively make the concentration in the very thin layer very large, and then when you do the electrolysis, the signal then is much, much higher. And so that's one advantage that you have with this particular thing. Now the thin layer material is often is mercury, but you can actually, for example, deposit metals on a, say, carbon electrode, strip them off. You can do it sometimes to do ions. You can uh, instead of reductively depositing metals, you can oxidatively deposit chloride ions uh, by forming, say, a mercury chloride species, which then you can reduce off, and so you can determine uh, ions in that particular way. So there's a whole raft of, of analysis that are involved with stripping analysis. We'll talk about that a little bit more.